Okay, so hey, let's go ahead and get started. So we got guys from all over the world. Fantastic. Oh, Matt, Matt's here from uh, Boston. I've been there before. Osman from Romania. Fantastic. All right. Argentina. We got London. Oh, that's so cool. And people, I love it, man. Mexico. Yeah, hey, I'm working on doing a, a webinar that has SQL tuning, but it's going to be in Spanish. There's a gal from uh, Argentina that I met on that tour. I took the OTN tour, and she's excited about doing webinars So in Spanish. So we're going to give that a shot. We've got something we're working on for, I think it's early February or end of January, something like that. So I've got an OS Watcher webinar coming up. A buddy of mine, Troy, is going to do that for us. And I'm working on some rack uh, uh, network interconnect. I'm trying to get that going too as well. So anyways, all right, well, I'm going to turn off the accepting new chats because people that can't get in, they're probably really upset now and, and all that kind of thing. So, all right, so let's go ahead and get going. Uh, all right, it, fantastic. Canada, all right, Vienna. Oh, man, that's cool. That's cool. So how many of you are actually, <clears throat> um, this is the first time to one of my webinars ever, whether you're a member or not, uh, first time. Just type in a yes or something like that in the chat box. Fantastic. Dang, got another audio blip there. All right. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, that's great, man. I guess all, all that marketing worked. So how many of you saw me at the, at the, the conference in Germany? When I did this presentation, anybody here that heard me? Because I, no, no, anybody? Okay, that, all right. So if you were there, yeah, uh, yeah, Muhammad, yeah, if you were there, that's it, just one, okay. I, I, I kind of rushed through that. They had me on this super sweet, massive, uh, screw, you know, stage kind of thing. It was really cool. And uh, I tried to do everything I could to get this done. And, um, and I came a little bit short and the really cool stuff is at the very end. And so I offered anybody if they wanted to, um, to join th this particular webinar and you don't need to be an OrbPub member. And I'm, and I was going to expand it from 45 minutes, which was what the presentation time was. I did, didn't even have a full hour. I was going to double that to an hour and a half so we could get through the whole thing. And you guys could ask a lot of questions. So that's the first thing I want to mention. If you have any questions, um, yeah, I'm trying to can't. Yeah. All right. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and chat those in. Okay. Um, I see them. They're like right in front of me on my screen here in my upper left. I don't know if you can see that, but I can see all of that. Um, and I'll respond right away if I can, or wait a little bit longer and worst case, I'll wait till the very end, but I will answer every question eventually. Um, even if we have to stay longer, I'll just officially end of the webinar and anybody who wants to, you know, stay, I'll just answer some questions. Okay. I mean, you guys give up a lot of time. So I, this is, this is what I do. So I'm cool with that. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. I think that is everything uh, at this point. So, um, so this presentation was given at the Germany Oracle user group just uh, about a week, about two weeks ago. And it was in Nuremberg and it's really cool. I think it is the world's best and in, in, in totality is currently the best Oracle user group conference in the world right now. There's nothing that can match that. It's, it's amazing. Um, and they had a bunch of presentations in English too, which makes it you know, kind of convenient for me. So, um, <clears throat> so the title here, right? How to diagnose random performance incidents using ASH. So I'm gonna go through this relatively quick, all right? But if you have questions, again, type those in. Um, okay, somebody can't hear audio. Can anybody else hear my audio? Anybody else? I can. Scott, you can. It looks like it's okay. All right. So if you can hear the audio, you're going to have to kind of figure that, figure that one out. But if something does drop, like you can't see my camera or video, you know, type something in the chat and we'll, we'll take a quick break or, you know, a quick, uh, break in the, in the, in the presentation real quick. To, to have other people let us know if they can hear or see. Okay, all right, so anyways, so this is the, essentially what we're gonna do is, what, just what it says, we're gonna diagnose, I'm gonna teach you how to diagnose performance incidents, which are short-lived, kind of like, boom, just burst of activity that freak people out and then it's gone. And people look at each other like, what happened? And 
and nobody knows, right? That's what we're focusing on. And to do that, we're going to use Ash, all right? Uh, yeah, web body, okay, cool, cool. So um, just I'm going to do a little bit more because I know there's a bunch of you that are not OrbPub members. So well, usually this is what you would see at the beginning of my webinars. I do two performance-focused webinars every month. And this is kind of usually how they start with, and I call them how-to webinars. It's about this is very, this is not the typical webinar. Usually, I'll kind of lecture for maybe ten minutes with talking, or fifteen max, with a few slides, and then all the rest I'm actually typing and, and demonstrating things. So this is actually um, uh, you know uh, a little bit, uh, in fact, a lot different in terms of uh, what's going on. Although I'm going to be doing a lot of demonstration, it'll just be recorded. I'm going to play a big video that I recorded the demonstration. So I guess it's similar in that way. Question here. Can you clarify how this relates to stats pack? All right. Stats pack does not have ash. Okay. Um, excuse me. Um, it does not relate to stats pack. Okay. Usually when I hear somebody talk about stats pack, they have Oracle standard edition and standard edition. Um, you, you, uh, you cannot legally license Ash on standard edition. Somebody told me, though, that it's actually there. You can enable it. I've never actually tried that before. But um, you'll, I'm sure you'll be breaking some kind of, you know, legal thing if you do that. Okay. So Ash, yeah, it is recording, Mark. <laughs> yeah. um, so Stats Pack is actually completely different than Ash. Okay. And, stat, and Ash is different from AWR as well. Okay, so we're gonna we'll talk more about that coming up. That's actually a really good, really good question. All right, so this is what we typically see when we start. Um, so I'm gonna give a I'm gonna uh, introduce myself here in just just a minute though. But um, if you guys, uh, th this is this is the primo stuff I give my members. And if anybody's interested in becoming an OrbPub member, um, there's a web page. You can go to my website, and here's the list of all the good stuff you get. And there's different levels of membership right here. So I wanted to mention that because I typically forget to say this, which is a big bummer. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to mention that to you. Um, all right. So I do LVCs and this, uh, and one of them is focused on ash. It's like a five or seven. I forget how many, when I do my LVCs, I do them in two hour chunks. There's two hours and usually there's a day break. And then I do another two hour chunk. And so I give you homework after each of the sessions. So it draws it out. And so it's not just like a brain dump. So they're really nice LVCs. I'm going to add one in uh, 2018, early 2018 on forecasting as well. But this one is going to be related to ash. Okay. Everything I'm talking, all, everything I'm going to tell you about, I cover in the, in that ash uh, LVC. All right. So I want to let you know about that as well. Okay. Here's the situation, all right? You run an AWR report, right? In fact, before that, the users say, hey man, my screen froze for 30 seconds. So they call you, right? And so you run an AWR report and you get something like this, okay? Now, if you're familiar with doing an Oracle time-based analysis or a DB time-based analysis, right? What you're gonna do, you're gonna look at this and you're gonna like mentally, at least initially, you're gonna categorize and group together the time, like CPU and wait time. And wait time is going to be I/O and non-I/O. And you're going to you're going to group that. And you're going to look for the big chunks of time. And those big chunks of time are your opportunities, right? So you're going to come up with solutions to go after those big chunks of time because users feel time. I mean, you know, performance. Users feel performance through time. So our objective would be to identify those opportunities, those big chunks of time, and develop solutions to go right at those big chunks of time. And so that's a time-based analysis that, in a nutshell. So if I look at this, I would say, hey, the biggest chunk of time, right, is CPU followed by IO, right here. I mean, physical read. So this is a mix of CPU and, and IO reads. Okay? And that's what I would focus on. OK, because I'm, I'm focusing on the instance, I'm focusing on the ocean of activity when I look at an AWR report. But then I say, but wait a second, the user said their screen froze for 30 seconds. So I've yet to see CPU freeze somebody's screen and I've yet to see IO single block reads freeze somebody's screens. So when I look at this AWR report 
and I and I do my typical analysis, I mean, this is not going to work. I can't solve the problem right here. In fact, what's probably happening is if, if this is a row level lock, it's going to be hidden within this NQ TX row lock contention. But in terms of the time, it's only like around 2,700 seconds, okay? 2,700 compared to 23 and 25,000. That's nothing. And I would never, ever focus on that unless I had somebody telling me their screen froze. But I still wouldn't have a lot of success trying to solve this with an AWR report. So the situation is like this, right? The AWR report says it's about CPU and I.O., but the users say their screen randomly locks. So it's like the users are this needle, right, in the big haystack. So the AWR report tells us about the haystack. The users are saying, hey, my screen locked, that's the needle. And so you get into this situation, right, where you have all this noise, that's like the haystack. But within there, there's like this signal of the needle and this is what we're looking for right so we this is what you see with an awr report when you properly do the ash analysis we can see this and that's what we're going for okay that's what this is all about all right so i'm going to teach you as best i can in an hour and a half how to actually do this all right and we're going to use some free tools um, and we want to end with having a really cool um this, you know, we're going to use R to actually do this. All right. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I'm hearing. Is that Bob Honey? How to webinars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm, hey, there's some people can't join. Uh, it's filled. Uh, we'll schedule another and it's being recorded. Okay. Dang. <laughs> you recorded. Yeah. Oh, man. I was so, so bad. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue on. So this is what we're going to go. All right. So let me introduce myself real quick. Uh, my name is Craig Shallowhammer, longtime Oracle DBA, and I special, uh, specialize in Oracle performance and predictive analysis. Okay, I do a lot of research, and I put that on my blog and author of a couple books that are still available. In fact, I have two book orders I have to do today. I do the book orders. <laughs> Do a lot of conference speaking and mentoring of Oracle DBAs and Oracle Ace Director, which is pretty cool. And I currently, I still am running the IOUG DBA uh, track, which is uh, which is pretty cool. All right, all right. So OraPub, OraPub is all about Oracle performance. I, I mean, my job is to work closely with Oracle DBAs who want to take their tuning skills to the next level. I just noticed my shirt is <laughs> the same shirt that I have in the picture. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I like the shirt. Anyway, so uh, my goal really in life professionally here is I want to help them members specifically uh, because they put food on my table to solve the toughest Oracle database performance problems. If I can go to bed at night and say I help somebody do that, it's been a good day for me. So, all right. So if you want to contact with me, okay, the best way for anybody to contact me is just to email me. Okay, Craig at orpub.com. I promise you I will respond. All right. It might take me a couple days. If you're a member, you better get a response, you know, within a day. Worst case scenario, like if I'm on an airplane or something. All right. All right. So I'm also on. Oh, I'm on LinkedIn, too. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, please do that. As long as you have a picture and you do something related to Oracle, I will actually, you know, accept. But I will not accept non-pictures. That just kind of creeps me out when I don't see a picture. OK, so let's get into the content right here. You guys all ready? Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Yeah, 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 I know, man, I hate that. All right, any questions? No? Okay, we're good. Are you guys still there? Somebody type in, yeah, yeah. Give me a yes or something. Here, good, all right, good, good. If you're not used to my webinars, I ask that question a lot because I have no idea if you guys are actually physically there, so. Okay, <clears throat> so. Let's say I needed to know what you do at work, okay? Why? Because maybe my manager wants, to, wants me to tell him if people are, are, at, are at their desk doing work, whatever. So I have a couple options. So I talked to you about this. And so what we determine, what we start with is you're going to fill out a timesheet, right? 
So basically, right, I feel a lot of times, every time you're doing some kind of task and you finish it, you're going to say, okay, I started and I finished this is how long it took. And, you know, and by the end of the day, you're going to just have this huge, hopefully, list of tasks that you completed. And you're going to give that to me. So you're going to rip that off. Okay. You're going to give that to me. And then uh, I'm going to put that, in, I'm going to put that in a pile right there. All right. So I'm going to have this stack, right? Multiple days. I'm going to have a stack and that worked out pretty good. All right. Um, my boss said, Hey, what was Fred doing? All right. And, and, um, uh, and I just, I pull the piece of paper. And I say, well, Fred, I, and I'll say, well, well, what time, uh, do you want to know what Fred was doing? And he said, oh, around 9.30. I said, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Fred was at his desk and he was uh, working on OEM. Too bad. He's a graphics guy, but he's, he's, he's all right. <laughs> so that's what he's doing. And he said, great, thanks. So this worked pretty good. So we decided to roll this out to the entire office or the entire company. Well, what happened, though, is every day I didn't get one piece. Or excuse me, like every day, right, I didn't get one piece of paper. I got a stack. And that was a problem because we got a big company and it became overwhelming. So we, we just couldn't do it. So what I started to do is at the end of the day is I took everybody's piece of paper and I summarized it. So I had one piece of paper to represent the entire day. And that actually worked okay from an, a company perspective. But if, that if my boss said, well, what was Fred doing yesterday at 930? Uh, I say, hey, I don't have the details. That's too much to manage. I, I shredded them. I threw, I threw the details away. And he's like, well, so what are we going to do? I said, well, if you really need that, that level of detail, then we're going to need to come up with a different strategy. Okay. What I just described to you was just like, an, like a, it's a time-based analysis. You wrote down the time. I store the detail. And then I'll, I'll have that maybe for a day. But what Oracle does is when an Oracle session disconnects, it essentially takes that piece of paper and it chucks it. Oh, but before it chucks it, it rolls up that information, right? It saves just the total. And so there's a problem there when we have incidents. So we've got to come up with a better solution, right? So ASH is our better solution. So what you and I decide to do is I say, you know what, instead of just writing everything down, instead of doing this time-based approach, let's try a sampling approach. So what I do is I put a camera behind you and I'm gonna take a picture of you at your desk. Okay, so obviously the first thing we need to talk about is, well, how often are we gonna take the picture, right? And so uh, you and I talk about this and we say, hey, let's just do it once a day at about 2.30. Okay, so every day, you know, I get one picture of you. All right. So um, I go ahead and, and, and we do that. The problem is, though, my boss said, hey, what was Fred doing yesterday at four o'clock? And I'll say, well, I, um, I don't know exactly. I mean, he was I can tell he was at his desk at 2.30 because I have a picture that was taken. But I don't know about four o'clock. And he says, well, I need to know that. I'm like, oh, shoot. So that's a problem. Right. So so you and I talk. Right. And we say, you know what, we need, I need to get more pictures every day. Uh, we need to increase the frequency, not once a day, maybe, I don't know, a couple times an hour. So we kind of have this back and forth discussion. You know, I suggest, hey, how about we take one picture every second? And you're like, Craig, whoa, man, that is kind of creepy. You're going to be taking pictures of me every second. So we say, you know, that, that's not good. So we kind of go back and forth and we agree that every like 15 or maybe 30 minutes, we'll get one picture, okay? So now I can answer all sorts of questions, okay? The boss says, hey, what was Fred doing at 2.30? I say, well, I got pictures every 15 minutes, so I can actually go back and I just look, a real simple query. I can pull up and say, well, Fred at 2.30 was at his desk and he was uh, watching Fox Sports. Yeah, that's what, I, and I got a picture to prove that too, all right? So I can answer those kind of questions. Now, if the boss says, well, what was Fred doing at 2.35? I'd say, well, I, I can't prove he was even at his desk, but he was at his desk at 2.30 and at his desk at 2.45 doing stuff. So I can infer that he was there, but of course I can't actually prove it. Okay, so that is just like Ash, except Ash, Right? It's a background process that every second takes a picture 
right, of every active Oracle session. And an active Oracle session means it's either consuming CPU or it's waiting to consume CPU. Okay, so that's what an active session is. All right, so that's what Ash is doing. So essentially every second, I have a stack of pictures from all of the active sessions. And I can answer all sorts of just crazy detailed uh, questions. So, uh, so what I can do now is answer, you know, I can have different types of reports to, to answer and, and to deal with different types of scenarios uh, that I find myself in. Now, what I'm going to show you today, I'm going to show you some of these reports, not all of them, okay, but these are the typical reports that I, I use when I do an incident analysis. There's other things we can do with ASH that I talk about in my, like a, a couple of webinars and in my, in my ASH LVC, but for this, we're, we're going to focus on just a few of these. The first report is kind of a summary, like a profiling report. It's almost like an it's almost like the top part of an AWR report where we can summarize what has happened over some period of time. But with Ash, we can go further because I can summarize the entire instance, which is like all of the pictures, right? I can summarize and profile a SQL ID because essentially I, with all these different stacks, I pull out just the pictures of the SQL ID or pull those out. And then I have like a subset of pictures. And then I can just summarize that. Like uh, when this when this SQL statement is running, right, and with all these pictures, um, you know, what's the percentage of time the CPU is on CPU? And what's the percentage of time that it's waiting? And when it's waiting, what's the top weight of it? So I can do that now. So I can kind of subset. <clears throat> and I can not only do this with the SQL ID, I can do it for a particular session, for a particular program or module. That's where it gets really cool, all right? So this is really useful. I'm not gonna run that today because I'm focusing on an incident. I'm not focusing on the entire situation, okay? Another common report we run is I call this the top anything. This is real common. People wanna know, well, what's the top CPU SQL statement? What's the top waiting SQL statement? What's the top waiting SQL statement when the wait event is DB file sequential reads, okay? Um, what's the, yeah, whatever, you know, or what's the top SQL when we're waiting on a, on a row level lock? Okay, we can answer those kind of questions, right? And we can get really crazy. We can say, well, what's the top session or the top module when sessions are waiting on a row level lock? So then I can figure out what's the module where the locks are occurring. So I can get all these really, really detailed answers to questions that are super, super useful when you have an incident. And remember, I define an incident is when we have, you know, things are going good and then like, boom, something happened, choo, right? Things slow down and then boom, things go back to normal. And people don't know why it happened. They don't know if it's gonna happen again and they're kind of shocked. And usually it's not, a, it's not a big group of users. It can just be a small group of users. So, all right, so a timeline. A lot of what we do in Ash is we're kind of following, right, a timeline, right? And with Ash, we can, it's really easy to timeline one individual session. So once I find a session that's interesting, I can kind of stalk the session. You know, CPU, CPU, boom, it's waiting on a lock. Boom, it, now it's been released. And I, can, and I can learn all sorts of stuff when it was like waiting on that lock. What was the program? What was the module? When, when it actually did the lock occur and who's the blocker, right? And I can just go, I can go from there. So a timeline report is really, really useful. It's something we don't have in an AWR report because an AWR report summarizes the entire instance. We're just focusing on one individual session and not just one picture. We got a lot of pictures. Very cool, very cool. Uh, let's see, got a couple questions here before I get to the, the last two here. Um, let's see, it's, um, um, I can ask, uh, we use standard edition, but really interested in Ash. I'm guessing some of this will be relevant. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in Ash, you can also write your own Ash collector. There, there are some free standard edition focused Ash collectors. I actually have one, but I haven't released it uh, because not enough people want to help me finish it. Um, but the, they, are, they are out there. The thing you got to watch out for is that a lot of the free collectors, they visually show you what's going on, but they don't save the samples. 
And I mean, if you don't save the samples, all you have is a graphical monitor, like, so what? What we're going to do here is we need to reference the past and we need the detail information. So the collector must save the information. If it saves the ASH or if it saves the B dollar session type information, then you can write the same simple scripts I'm going to show you on that data. It's pretty amazing. All right. Um, let's see. What is the minimum interval um, to take the stat, system stats? Well, okay, if we're, if we're talking ASH, the default is once every second, but there's an instance parameter, and you can do that every millisecond if you wanted to. I've never tried it that fast, but you can't increase the frequency rate. I've done it. It's very cool. In terms of system stats, I'm thinking like V$ SESTAT, the typical AWR stuff, and that's actually sampled typically once an hour unless you actually change that. Okay? But within the AWR one-hour snapshot, ASH is actually collecting, right? And that information is stored in an AWR table. That's in the DBA HIST active CES history table. Okay. But when the when the when the one second granularity ASH data gets copied into the AWR table, um, Oracle chucks, right? They throw away 90% of the data. So we get one ash row out of every 10 that we have in V$ dollar active session history. Okay, so essentially we get instead of one second granularity in V$ dollar ash in the AWR dash, we get we get 10 second granularity, which still works pretty good, but it's nothing like one second though. All right, okay, okay. The other thing um, I do is is um, uh, it's really helpful to visualize something. Sometimes we can uh, we can talk about a situation great with numbers. Sometimes we create some kind of a timeline and a report. We can stock a session, something like that. But sometimes when there's a lot of different sessions involved, it's nice to get like a snapshot, boom, a picture of what's going on. And to do that, I'm, I'm going to do that for you. And we're going to see something like this, right? And we're going to see something. We're going to see something like this that we're going to talk about. All right, so I'm going to show you how to actually do that kind of thing. Uh, with all free software, it's mind-blowing. You guys are going to love this. Okay. The other thing we do, and this is where how I usually start my ASH and, uh, incident analysis. This is an interval timeline. What you're going to see is I'm going to do a report, and each line is a summary of all the active sessions. So I have like this line's a summary, and this line's a summary, this line's a summary. But the cool thing about it, though, is I can vary how much time is related to each of those lines. So one line could represent one hour of all the ASH activity. It could, it could represent 10 seconds of activity. It could represent four hours of activity. You get to change that. And we're gonna use that very strategically to start at a kind of a high level and kind of work down until we see something interesting and then we can drill right into it, all right? All right, so that's very cool. That's how I usually start my, my analysis, okay? All right. Good questions, you guys. All right, now I'm gonna kind of skip through a bunch of this, but this is kind of my thinking, how I do things. Um, okay, the, the most important thing here, well, there, actually there's a bunch of important things here, but the thing that I wanna highlight here is that in order to do an instant analysis, we need, we need some kind of a time marker. I need a date and the time, all right? And sometimes I don't have a, a lot of details. Somebody says, well, it was around, around 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, can you be more specific? Well, no. Okay, great. Well, that means it could be anywhere between like 8.30 and 11.30. You know what I mean? So if they say this is when the problem happened and they're not real precise, you need to start looking, you know, and end looking way, way. You got to give yourself a lot of room, okay? If somebody says, well, it was at 10.34, I'm like, wow, that's really precise. How, how do you know that? They said, well, I looked at the clock when it happened. I said, thank you very much. So now, 1034, I'm going to give just a little bit plus or minus. And the reason I, I also do the plus and minus on that is because if it, even if the incident affected them at 1034, there could be like a buildup before that. And I want to see kind of what's brewing before, boom, the incident actually happens. Right. So that's why you don't want to be, you know, if somebody says this is the incident, you don't want to be too tight. You want to give yourself some room so you can see what happened before the incident and what happened just after. OK, you're going to see me do that when I do the demo here. OK, 
Um, all right. Um, yeah, yeah. So the best thing is some kind of a log, like an alert log, um, a cluster log file, something that has a, a actually recorded date and time, because those typically don't lie and they're very specific. And so that is like the best, right? And if you can get a confirmation from a person with a log, you know, that's like, man, that's like, you got it. So that's really important. That's the, one of the most important things here uh, in this page to take away. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is I have two toolkits that you can download off my website uh, for free. One's called Bloodhound Toolkit, which is more of a more of a professional kind of tool. That's what we're going to use for the uh, when we do the visualization. All right. The scratch pad is all it is. It's a text file. Now, anybody who uses Ash a lot, they're going to have a text file and they're going to keep their their favorite Ash scripts in there. And when it comes time to use Ash, they're going to pull up their scratch pad and they're going to make some modifications. They're going to copy and paste that into SQL Plus. OK, the scratch pad is just my scratch pad. Okay, and it's organized in a pretty good fashion and it's super easy to use. OK, so I'm going to show you how to use that. Um, I make in both the Bloodhound Toolkit and the Scratch Pad, I use SQL plus defines, right? You know, you set basically, a, a, it's not a variable, but you set a define in SQL plus. I use that a lot. This, this, um, this means I don't have to store information in tables or some other object. So there's no, there's no DML, there's no DDL. Everything is a select and the settings are all saved and defined. So it's super lightweight. People don't even know you're, you're querying stuff usually. All right. So we're going to start with the scratch pad because it's really easy to use. And then for the visualizations for these pictures, we're actually going to we're going to pull the ash data. We're going to put it in a format that we can just copy and paste that into R. And R is a free statistics package. And when we do that, like, boom, we're going to get these pictures. It's really cool. So I'm actually going to show you how to um, how to get R. We're going to uh, show you how to install R. So I'm going to lead you through the entire process. This is why doing all this in 45 minutes is really difficult. <laughs> all right. Um, are there manuals? There's readme files. On the scratch pad, um, you just kind of, you can look at it top down. There's a lot of text. You'll see that. When we do this, the Bloodhound Toolkit, um, there are there is some free demos. There's like a couple free like public uh, webinars how to use Bloodhound. And if you just go to my webpage um, on the webinar web webpage, just search for Bloodhound and, and you'll see those. And you're going to see it here uh, uh, today as well. But there is a README file for the Bloodhound Toolkit. OK, I mean, I worked I've worked a lot of time on the Bloodhound Toolkit. It's really cool. It does some other stuff that I'm I mean. It, and one of the coolest things is it can pull remote ash data, V$ dollar or DBA hist from a production system into your local database. And it will save that in a table. And then you can work and do your analysis on, on your local database using production data. It does some really cool stuff like that. Okay, so um, I've worked a lot on this. One, uh, one of our members, Andrea Salzano, he worked his a lot on this thing and so andre and myself have put a lot of time into this andre is just awesome so i don't know if he's on this or not but um, um he's he's done so much work with this it's just been fantastic all right so let's let's go ahead and uh, and do the first demo so how i'm going to do this i'm going to explain this to you a couple slides and i'm just going to start the video and i'm going to talk through the video and so i can stop it anytime we want to um, I stopped doing demos in conference presentations because bad stuff happens, man. <laughs> so, I don't, so videos are pretty safe. Okay, so here's the situations. Some users, right, think needle, not instant. Some users said when they got back from lunch around 2 p.m., that's uh, e Oracle eBusiness Suite, the batch processing queue was stuck and it started building up. Right. Hmm. OK, so that that's what I heard. Hey, Craig, you know, 2 p.m. This is what people are saying. All right. So I started doing my research. OK, I found out that the database time was nine hours ahead of the users. OK, so when they said 2 p.m., right, um, then that's actually 11 p.m. So we're actually talking around 2300 hours, that kind of thing. OK, 
Also, one of the DBAs, DBA said, hey, Craig, I thought you might want to know this, you know, that in the alert log, there was actually a deadlock mess message that was posted at 1112. And I'm going to show you an extract of that in just a second. And when I heard that, I was like, boom, got it. See, that's the confirmation, right? The user said 2 p.m., okay? The nine hours ahead means actually 11 p.m. The alert log says 11, 12, boom, confirmation. So now I know where to look. So that is huge. Okay, now I get to the interesting part. This is the stuff you only find out, right, after you just, you talk to people for a while, right? And you kind of reduce the stress level. Well, I found out, um, and this was confirmed because when I was looking at the alert log, right, they gave me an extract of the alert log so I could see the deadlock message. I noticed that there was a lot of sessions that were being killed. Every, I mean, just they, they seemed random. There was no timing. It was just random sessions, Oracle sessions were killed. I thought, well, that's kind of odd. You know, I mean, sometimes sessions are killed, but not like what I was seeing. And so I asked these guys, I said, hey, man, did, you know, I noticed there's a lot of sessions that are killed. And they said, yeah, sometimes you get real level locks. And so we just kill the session and it releases them and everything's good. I thought, okay. Um, and I didn't say this to them, but I'm thinking in my mind, and this is important for you guys to understand. This is a batch processing system. So just think, let's say, how can I do this? This is easier on a, on a platform. But let's say I got two batch processes. There's one, like they're, 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 they're running together in parallel. And, it, and that's important that they both finish before the next process can begin. So this, this process has the dependency on both of these processes finishing. So let's say there's a lock and the DBAs decide to kill this one. What's going to happen is that this process can never start because even if this one finishes, this one disappeared. And so that's just going to hold up one of the batch queues. Have, think about doing this over and over again. Eventually, you're going to fill up all the batch queues and nothing's going to happen. So a key takeaway here is that when you have a complex batch system that where there's dependencies, if you start killing sessions, it might work for a while, but eventually you're going to run into this kind of situation. So be, just be careful about that. So there's a combination of things. There was locking going on. There was this complex batch environment and DBAs were killing processes. All right. So that gave me a lot of clues what was going on. Oh, the other thing is that... Um, uh, the users were like on the East Coast, U.S. I live on the West Coast. So that was yet another time zone. And, of course, there was a bunch of outsourced DBAs. And so they were in different time zones. And everybody logs what was going on on their local time zone. Crazy, right? That's what happened. So it was, kind of, it was, it was difficult to get everything coordinated. So here's the C says global NQ services deadlock. All right. And there's the time right there. 2312. So that is my clue. That is my, that is like my ticket. That is my whatever. That's the door that I'm going to start looking at the ASH data. Now I'm not going to start there. I'm going to give myself plenty of room, begin in the end. And then I'm going to slowly kind of look closer and closer and closer until I see something of interest, but I expect to see it right around 2312. All right. So uh, instead of the typing, we're going to let the video go. All right. So let me get this nice and big. I'm going to put uh, my picture up here. All right. If you guys got any, any, anybody have any questions so far? Okay. This thing, this video lasts about 20 minutes, 22 minutes, but, uh, um, uh, but it'll take us longer because I'm going to stop and talk about things. All right. Any questions? You guys still there? Everybody's still there? Still got a full room. Enrique, all right. Hey, thanks for yeah, thanks for the feedback. I really need that. Okay, I'm just like you guys, right? If you if you're talking in an, into a mirror, you're wondering is anybody actually there? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great, cool. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to take you from the very beginning right here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to download the tools and we're going to use the scratch pad. So you go to resources tools, you scroll down, okay. And there's the Ash Scratch Pad right there. In fact, I got two cursors going, so I'm going to stop. All right, so we're going to we're going to click the download button, and then boom, 
Okay, but I, I stopped it. Good. All right, you're going to get the scratch pad right here. This is what it looks like. This is a text file that shows up right away in your browser because it is a text file. Okay. Um, and so you see, I, I update this thing a lot. In fact, there's a newer version I, that I have not posted today. It's just a little cleaned up. You can see I kind of describe what's going on. And I actually, if you're new to, to Ash, I have a little section here at the beginning called Understanding Your Ash Data. It's some real simple queries to kind of get you familiar with, with, with just the Ash data. Because if, if it's new to you, it's actually kind of confusing, actually. Right? Because, you know, Oracle stores this in, in, in a ring structure. And, you know, there's, it's just, there's more to it. And it seems really trivial if you've used Ash for a while, but if you haven't, it's not that trivial. Okay, so first I have some common defines, and there's three, there's three common defines that every single script references, okay? We have to figure out the data source, okay? In other words, like, what is, where is the Ash data? Is it V$ Ash? Is it DBA hist or is it an extract of ash data you stored in a table? We can we can query or we can do our analysis right off of an extract. It's the same it's the same columns, right? So it shouldn't be a problem. So we got to define the source. Then we need to know the timing details, like what's the date and the time of the incident, you know that kind of thing. Now, so we have to set that. Now, if we're using AWR ash data. There will be, I, I will need to enter in a, DB, a DBID and an instance number. Okay, that, that I have to do that so I can you know, find my ASH data. If I'm not using the AWR ASH data, there will not be a DBA, there, there will not be a DBID or an instance number. And so I'm gonna set that to find to just something that's true. In other words, I just don't use it, but it's in every script because the scripts all kind of have this general format right here. Select some stuff from the source, where the timing details, you know, um, basically I have all this ash data, right? So the timing details are going to like start and end. So this is going to give me a subset of the pictures, right? And then of course, if, I have D, if I'm looking at the DBA data, DBA hist data, um, I need to be looking at the right database, okay? So all of the reports references. So I'm logging into my box. I'm gonna go to System Manager, super secure. Still a, a 12 one. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up these, these defines right here. So I'm gonna, first I'm gonna set is the data source. And you can see usually it's DBA, or it's V$ Active Session History or DBA Hist. But I have an extract. I've actually saved ASH data. I pulled it out. In fact, let me tell you, I got a little more time here. Um, I actually have a script to, to do this below in the scratch pad. But essentially what I'm doing is, okay, in summary, I'm trying to take actual ASH data. I'm going to copy it into a different table. And the table name is what I'm entering right here. So essentially what I'm doing is create table this, right, as select star from V$ active session history or DBA hist where and then I define you know the data that I actually want and so this creates a table the benefit of this is that that table will not be archived right because right but you're at your V$ ash data could be gone in, a, in an hour your DBA hist data when your AWR data gets gets archived so does that DBA hist uh, AWR or a DBA hist ash data also is 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 deleted and so if you want to save stuff for later analysis you know, or for whatever reason you know save it into a different table that's what I did so I'm going to reference the ash data that I've saved in this table okay so hopefully that make this is one of the most confusing things to people so I have to set my data source that's the or a SQL plus define I paste it in there and boom, I have it set, okay? Now, since a lot of times I make mistakes when I do this, I'm gonna see, is there actual data here? And so there is, there is. In fact, this is the DBA, DBID and the instance that I actually want, and there's like 126,000 rows. So, so far, so good, okay? But I've only set the source. Now I need to drill into, or I need to set the database ID and the instance number, okay? That's what I'm looking for. That's what I need to set. So that's a define. So I'm going to paste that into SQL plus. Okay. Now this is the critical one for this incident is that we need to set the date and the time. So I'm going to, I'm going to set that date and time, right? Was it the 25th or the 15th of May, 
2006. The incident was around 11, 11 something. So we're going to start around 2,200 hours. Not, we're going to step before that, okay, so I can see the buildup, okay? And then we're going to end just like basically at midnight, okay? So we're going to set that 15 May at, at like, you know, 2359, okay? Now, if you guys got any questions, go ahead and type those in, okay? Otherwise, I'm just going to keep rolling here. Oh, in fact, let me stop. You guys can see this okay, right? I should have asked that before. You can see the video playing because I've never done a video playing like, okay, good. Because I've never played a video during a webinar. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right, because usually this is, I do all this live on my webinars. Okay, so now we've set uh, the begin and the end, you know, where, where we're going to look. And that's in the define. So we're going to copy and paste that into SQL Plus. So now I have my three core defines set. Data source, DBA has details, and the timing details. Now, Every Ash Scratch Pad script will reference these three defines and probably some more. So now I'm going to do a final check to make sure I actually have some data. It's really easy to mess up, especially on the timing settings. And I want to make sure there is actually some data. So, okay, good. You can see that there's like 8,600 rows. So that's when I do, when I, when I do my analysis, the big, the kind of the superset of data here I'm going to look at is there's 8,600 rows I'm going to be looking at. Remember, I started with 126,000, so I've already you know, reduced it quite a bit. Okay, there's some common formats um, for, for um, uh, what's that? Oh, <laughs> it's funny. Anyways, there's some common column formats, and I just copy and paste those in. You know? And, of course, you can change all this stuff yourself, right? I mean, it's a text flow. All right, so those are set. Um, and there's like the, remember I talked about some of these, these common scripts, there's this top anything, there's the timeline, there's the profile, and here's this interval timeline. And I call this the tick report. Okay, let me stop this. Remember, this is that summary report where each line is a summary over so many seconds, right? Like it could be four hours, it could be 10 seconds. I'm going to start where each line, right, is a summary of all the ASH activity with in those three defines, right? Each line is going to be a summary of 600 seconds. So the only thing I need to set in this entire report, which is the most complicated one I have here, is just this one define right here, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, let that one go. So I set it to 600. I'm going to copy and paste all this stuff. Oh, notice there's the data source, the timing details, and the hist, DBA hist details. That's in every one of these reports, right? All right, so we're gonna copy all this. All the other reports are super simple compared to this one, okay? All right, paste it in there, and it's it's truly there. Let's run it, and boom, okay? Now it wraps around, don't worry about that. I fixed that, okay? Now, if you look at, remember, we did 600 second summarizations. So if you look here, you'll notice that the time jumps in 10 minute increments, and 10 minutes is, uh, 600 seconds, right? So you can see that right here. And and you can see this is pretty close to where I set my begin and end time. It's not going to be exact, but it's pretty close. Okay, so let me stop that. So this is the this is the beginning sample date and time, the minimum sample ID. Every time Ash takes a picture, right? Like every time I take a picture of all the active sessions, there's a sample ID associated with that. Okay, within this 10 minutes here, this is the first one, all right? This is the minimum right here, okay? Now, how many pictures, when I, when I take a picture of everyone in the office, all the active sessions, in this, in this case right here, when I add up all the 10 minutes worth of pictures, there was 466. So this is the total active sessions. But when I look at the, the, the how many active sessions there are at, at, per second, on average, this is the average active sessions, there's only 7.8. So this is a little confusing for people, okay? All the pictures within the 10 minutes, all of those is 466, okay? But if I take an average of that over 10 minutes, the average is seven, there's only 7.8 active sessions. There could be 20, there could be two, but on average there was 7.8, okay? So now this is a little bit about classifying the time right here, but it's not time, it's samples, 
Okay, these are all, it's based on counts. So out of the 466 pictures, 34% of those pictures say like on CPU for a session. The remaining about 66%, those sessions say waiting. And then there's some associated wait event. Well, the most common or the most popular or like the top wait event um, when we were waiting was DB file sequential reads. Okay. Now there could be another wait event that is almost as popular, okay? But there's only one top, and this is what it is for this particular 10 minutes. Now, what we're looking for, the incident, is around 2310. It's around here, okay? So I think I'm gonna move my, yeah, okay. So around 2310 is the incident, and if we look at that, we say, well, wait a second, the top weight of it is direct path reads. I'm looking for a row level lock. I'm looking for some kind of a lock. So what I'm gonna do is I need to drill into that, kind of stretch that out. So I'm gonna look at this every 60 seconds, which means I'm gonna get a lot more rows, probably what, 10 times the rows, something like that. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do from 600 to 60. So I'm gonna, it's the same exact SQL. I just reset the define, boom, I run it. And I got about 10 times the rows right here. Notice there's a lot more detail. And there, this is, you gotta be careful with ASH. There's so much detail, you can get overwhelmed by that. You can see now that we're jumping at one second intervals or 60 second intervals. Okay, that's what the report wants to do. Now we need to go around 2310 is what we're looking for. Okay, and it, it took me a while to find it here. There we go, you guys probably already spotted it. There we go, boom, row level lock. Okay, at this point, I'm like, yes. I'm super pumped because if I don't see that at the 60 second level, I'm gonna go down to the 10 second level. And if I can't see it there, I can't see it. So I, there could be a problem. So thankfully I see it right here and I'm actually really excited about this, right? In real life, I am I, I, I take a break and have, get a coffee because I am really excited. Because now I've not only got a confirmation from the users, the alert log, but now I actually see it in the ASH data. Okay, now we're gonna go down. Uh, oh, so what I do now, now that we found it and I know the time, right, I'm gonna, instead of looking at, you know, this big plus or minus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it a lot tighter. I'm not gonna make it as tight as most people think, but because remember, we started at, the event is around 2310, something like that. So I'm gonna start about, what is that? Uh, around 20 minutes before, and let's see, how long do I, do I change this? I think I do. 2310, so I give it about 20 minutes on, I do 20 minutes plus or minus. I reset that, which means I'm gonna paste the define in here. Okay, so notice there's 128 rows. Okay, there's 128 rows. I reset the timing details. Now, because there's less time, there should be less rows, right? I shouldn't show all these rows because I'm gonna go to 2330. So I shouldn't see any of these rows because these are beyond the 2330, right? So let's go ahead and run that. I'm checking the define and make sure, you know, that's good. You can see my three key defines right there. That looks good. So, and I'm still doing the 60 seconds. So the SQL's still there. Boom, I just run it and boom. And now we can, now I only have 23 or what, 39 rows instead of the what, 126, something like that. So let's scroll up here and there's the 2310 and there's my row level lock, okay. All right, now you can see here at 60 seconds, you know, this is not a very long locking situation, all right? So I'm gonna go look at one more level of detail. I'm gonna look at it at the 10 second level. This is the lowest level of detail with AWR ASH data that I can get. Same SQL, so I'm just gonna rerun it and I get a lot more rows back now, okay? Now, I'm gonna stop for a second. You notice that's that 176 rows. Um, you can, if you have thousands and thousands of, you know, or hundreds of active sessions, uh, you could get so much data back. You're going to need to reduce the amount of data. You have to continually keep looking at fewer and fewer and fewer rows as you get more detail in your analysis. Otherwise, you're going to be overwhelmed by all the data and it can get really confusing. So uh, it's hard to even explain that until you've actually encountered that yourself. Okay. All right, so we're at 2319. You can see we're jumping here at like 10 second intervals. You notice that in the time. Now let's go back up to around 2310. 
All right, all right, here we go. So we can see now, uh, we're gonna find the first time we see a lock right here, 2310. Now it's actually up above a little bit. Yeah, there's one of them. There's one right there at the top, 20, there we go. I finally found it. Okay, so that's the begin. But you notice there's other things besides locking going on. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to highlight this particular incident. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, what do we what we have just did is that I now have an answer to a key management question. Craig, when did it when did it begin? When did it end? And how many sessions were involved? Okay, well I know it started at 23:10:05 and 23:10:35. Now it could have spilled over because this is just the top wave event, but so I will check that. But right now, my answer is 20. This basically lasted 30 seconds. Well, how many sessions were involved? They were all anywhere from 5 to 10. Now, that doesn't mean there were 10 or 8 sessions that were locked. These are all of the active sessions right here. Okay? But management now knows begin the end. It knows we're not talking about hundreds of users. We're talking about a needle. This is a true needle in the haystack situation right here. Okay. All right. So that's very important, but sometimes might not seem important. That's critically important for an analysis like this. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. What are we doing here? Okay. Now we're going to timeline. Okay, okay. So what we just did, we looked at the interval timeline. We are summarizing the data, right? Now we're gonna go down and we're gonna run the report that I can actually follow an individual session or sessions if I want to. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set some two additional defines, okay? Um, I'm gonna set the columns that I wanna see on the report and I can then set the where clause to further define what I wanna see. And look, look how simple that SQL statement is for the timeline. I mean, it's ridiculously simple. And that's how most ASH reports look. It's only when you get in some kind of, I'll say exotic uses of ASH, like uh, finding like when the, you know, when the plan changed and, and estimating SQL statement uh, uh, execution times using ASH data, stuff like that. Um, do the do the reports get more complicated? But these classic reports are very very straightforward. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set two things, right? The columns that I want to see, okay? And I'm going to see I want to see the event, the SQL ID, the blocking session, and the module. Now I know this is a locking situation, so I will for sure want to see the blocking session, okay? Also I will also want to see the blocking session instance ID. Remember, this is a three node rack cluster. So if I show the blocking instance ID, I can tell whether the lock is being held by a session in the other ASH instance, right? Or in the other rack, you know, instance or cluster. Okay, the node, that's the word, other rack node. Okay, but I know the answer, you just gotta trust me. It's not an inter, well, it's not, the locking is not going on between instances. It's all centered in this one instance. So I'm not gonna show that. It makes the report too wide. Second thing, second thing is I know, because I've done this like a thousand times, that the module is very important to solving the mystery of this particular situation, okay? So I just wanted to show you that, I, I wanted to kind of skip a bunch of this as I discover that, but I just want to sh tell you, this is why I'm showing the blocking session, why I'm not showing the blocking instance ID, and why I, why I am showing the module, okay? It's because I've done this before and I kind of know the answer, right? Okay, so we're gonna set, we're gonna copy and paste this into SQL Plus. So when this report runs, these are the columns that they're gonna show, right? Now I need a where clause. Now in this case, I'm gonna show all of the sessions. No, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to show just the sessions that are waiting on a lock, but this will give me a, a more of a broader perspective of what's going on here, right? So we're going to do the where clause. So it's real simple here. It's, I don't always do that because you can get a lot of rows back sometimes, but there's not that many rows here. So you can see we have our three core defines plus the two extra. Okay. Now, Let's take that SQL and copy and paste it into SQL Plus. Okay. All right, so I'm going to copy, I'm going to paste, boom. All right, there we go. 
So this is the this is the timeline report, okay? And this is AWR data. So you're going to notice that time jumps in 10 second intervals. If this was V dollar active session history, you would see one second intervals. All right. Now remember, I'm showing all the sessions. So every single session that's active is going to show up here, right? Within our within the constraints that we that we have. Okay. And you can see I I I'm up here at 2310. Okay. All right. So you see, since this is all the active sessions, see, this is one of the sample periods here, right? At 23.10.05. And there was row level lock. So this is the first time I see that. Okay. And you're going to see, see, and then the next sample period is 23.10.15. The next one is 23.10.25. See, they were jumping in 10 seconds, right? And that's, there's, there's a bunch of them there. And then the next one's 10, 23.10.35. Okay. Notice that not everybody's waiting on a lock, right? We have some sequential reads sessions you're waiting on. There is some sessions that are on CPU. There's a bunch of different SQL statements that are running and there's different modules involved. Clearly there are some blocked sessions right here. Okay. So I wanted to, I want you to, to know that we can not just look at one session. We can look at a group of sessions at the lowest level of detail that Ash actually provides us. Now, what we want to do, though, we want to focus on the sessions that are locked. So we're going to, we're going to strip away a bunch of the data now. We're, we're going to reset the define, and we're going to take, and this is going to get super simple now, very obvious. Okay, so we're just looking at the row level locks, and we just want to look at the time, those 30 seconds, when, our in, when the situation began and when it ended, and there it is, right there. Okay, so we're going to stop for a second. Now, and I couldn't do this in a conference, okay? But I want you guys to look at this and, and type in there, chat in there, things that seem kind of interesting to you looking at this. There's a number of things that are very important that give us big clues about this analysis. So what do you see here? Type those in. This is the kind of stuff I do in my webinars usually. Okay, the, all right, the, so you can see the locks are like chained, right? Okay, okay, we'll look at that. People using SQL Plus on the database? They are? Oh yeah, you can see them up there. Excellent, excellent. Okay, okay, a couple of you guys got the module. See that in coin module, whatever that is? Uh, that is, that's, everybody's in that module. Okay, all right, anything else, anything else? Uh, let's see. Uh, not totally the same SQL ID on the timestamp. Not totally. Okay. Yeah, three sessions potentially uh, the issue. Okay. Excellent. Good job, you guys. I mean, that's really good. You got all the key things. Let me go over those real quick. Okay. First of all, we're only looking at row level locks, so don't expect to see anything else. Okay. <laughs> okay. The, the one, the, there's the, one of the most obvious thing. There's two. We'll start on the far right. Okay. The far right is. Everything is in this one module. <clears throat> when I saw that, I immediately asked, hey, what is this module? And the response was, well, this is a custom EBS module that we developed. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. So all the locks are occurring in your custom module. So you might want to take a look at that module, okay, because you're having to kill sessions, or at least you're feeling that you need to kill sessions. And those sessions are running SQL in this module right here. Okay, is my I'm inferring that. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing here is that there's multiple SQL statements involved. Okay, which is not not uncommon when you have a locking situation. You know, you can run the same SQL ID or different SQL IDs that lock the same row. But it's interesting that there's different SQL IDs originating from the same module that are involved in this locking situation. So that tells me that there's something kind of wacky going on in that actual module, okay? All right. <clears throat> um, okay, now, the chaining. Now, this is something, yeah, you guys are seeing this, Vakla. <laughs> you guys are good, man. Um, this is what DBAs can see. And non-DBAs have a hard time seeing this. So let's just, let's pick one of these. I wonder if, I think I'm going to highlight just one sample time here. All right, all right. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm going to highlight one of these. Okay. 
yeah, here's the second gathering, there's the third, and then that's the fourth right there. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna look at this one. Okay, so there's only there's only three sessions that are that are locked here. Okay, the the holding session um, may not be it it may be on CPU, but it may not be as we'll see. So let's take a look at this. Okay, this is session one one nine two is waiting on a row level lock held by the blocking session. Right, the blocker is two five two three. What's 2535 doing? Hey, look it, it's over here. And it's waiting also on a row level lock, but it's waiting, right, on session 1747. Hmm. What's 1747 doing? It's over here. It's also waiting on a row level lock held by 2535. What's 2535 doing? It's waiting on a row level lock held by 1747. What's 1747 doing? It's waiting on 2523, and you can see now that I am stuck in this loop. That's the deadlock right there. Okay, there you go. Uh, now, there could have been a lot of sessions. There could have been a few sessions, but eventually in the deadlock, wherever you start, if you follow this path, if you're jumping around, eventually you're going to end up in some kind of a, uh, like a loop that you cannot get out of, and that, that, is, that is the deadlock right there. Yeah, yep, as seen in the alert right there, okay? And you'll, if you follow this on, on all of these, every single one of these uh, falls into this deadlock loop somehow, okay? So when, when, I, when I ran this, when I did this kind of situation, <clears throat> um, I saw this. I said, you know, it'd be really nice to actually create a picture of this uh, because the first thing I want to do is to take out a piece of paper and kind of diagram this. So I said, well, why don't we do that in R? So let's go ahead and just, just do that, all right? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start, we're gonna do this, we're gonna take this data, we're gonna, we're gonna diagram this, this in R. So we're gonna have to install R on your laptop to do this, and we're gonna, we're gonna write us, we're gonna pull this data out, and we're gonna paste it into R, okay? All right, so as I'm, there we go. So how do you find R? You go to Google. All right, so this is kind of part two now. I know we've, we've already gone, we're already over an hour, so we only have about 25 minutes left right here. 20 minutes left, not a lot of time. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna go through this pretty quick here. So you gotta find R. You can download this on Linux, for Linux, Mac, uh, Windows, okay? How do you find something that starts with R? Put R stats and you're gonna see this R project right here. Just go to the website and every time I've gone there, there's a download is over upper right right here i see all click it okay click the download r right there it's like right there guys okay <laughs> click it and you can pick where you want to download it right pick one of those and here you go you can download linux mac os x windows click that this is the windows one okay the mac ones it's just as easy as this i, I run i'm on a mac so notice this install r for the first time what do you think you click <laughs> this is the way stuff should be written right so you click on that and you're going to actually install R. It literally will take three minutes max. Take all the defaults and boom, it'll be up and running on your laptop. It's, it's, the, it's the way software ought to be. Okay. So now we got to get the Bloodhound Toolkit because we're going to do this not using the scratch pad. So you go to resources, tools, you scroll down to get to the Bloodhound Toolkit and you click the download button and download it. It's a tar file. You XVF it and just put it on your put it on your server or whatever. Um, it's going to, you know, every all the scripts are downloaded or extracted in one one directory. Once you have that quote installed, which is essentially uh, if you want, you set the Oracle, your Oracle path so it can see the Bloodhound scripts. There's, uh, there is only SQL scripts. There's no shell scripts or anything else. So it works on any environment. Once um, it's installed, and remember, there is a readme file. Okay, I'll say it again. Remember, there is a readme file. Take a look at that. It'll tell you how to install it, which is like three steps. I mean, ridiculously easy. Once um, you know you you can see the scripts. Uh, there is a menu. It's actually called BH for Bloodhound menu. That's, it's a SQL script, and these are all the scripts. You see there's not a bunch of them, right? 
I'm, nobody's trying to impress anybody with this toolkit by, by making it complex. All that we're going to focus on is the visualization tools. And so we're going to run that BH visual script right there. There's support scripts and we have the core analysis tools, which are just like the ones in the scratch pad, but they're, they're, they're cooler. You could do more neat stuff with them. Okay. There's that BH set. And that's how we set the analysis scope. It sets a bunch of defines just like in the scratch pad. So we need to run BH set. Of course, it needs to be lowercase. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. It's, you can set the number of parallel query slaves. There's some other things we can set that I'm not going to talk about. Okay. We can pull data remotely, which means it's going to prompt us for some access information. And, but we're going to access local data. Okay. The default is V-Dollar Active Session History, but we're going to use our data that we used in the scratch pad, this BH, you know, 207-2016 table. So that's the data we're going to reference. Now, there's there, this, this window type, you know, um, what we typically do in an instant is we know the begin and the end. So we're actually going to say this is the begin time, this is the end time. That is what we did with the scratch pad. But sometimes we want to look at the data as it kind of just floats through time. Like I want to look at the last five minutes of data or I want to look at just the last half hour worth of data. That's kind of a floating window. It's relative. We're not going to do that, though, because we're looking at a particular, you know, date and time. Okay. So whoops. So what's, what's happened here is that this is the table where the data is at. The script will now look at and it will pull the data out and it'll say, well, these or this is the data you can actually report off of. And I think we're looking at instance one, right? Yeah. We're going to put our date and time here. Okay. Now, this really doesn't make too much of a difference because we're actually going to, for this, because all we really want to do is to create the graph. We're not going to do analysis. So this isn't so important here. And you'll see why in a minute. So I just put something that kind of made sense just to not to confuse people too much. Okay, we're not going to run all the other scripts like we did in the scratch pad. We're just going to do the visualization stuff here. Okay, all right. So um, that is done. You can see the snap IDs are set. You can see all that kind of stuff. So you can see all these defines. By going through the process we went through, we set a bunch of defines, whereas in the scratch pad, we set those manually. Okay. Now we're going to run the visualization script. Okay, so here's what we do. You type BH visual, and it's going to prompt us a few questions, and then we will be ready to rock and roll. So it needs to know, are we looking at DBA hist data, like AWR ash data, or the V dollar? There is a difference, so I need to know that. I need to know the table. Okay, um, if it's not like, you know, V dollar stuff, that's my table, right? That's, you guys recognize that. I need to put the DB ID in. Well, that is not the database ID, all right? So I'm going to scroll up because I think it's probably saved in the define. And there it is. So that's my database ID. It's also up there as well, okay? So I'm going to copy and I'm going to paste that in there. Okay, boom, got it. All right, now this is, I'm going to pause this. This is so cool. This visualization, it can be, it could show one instance or it can show the entire rack cluster. This is so cool uh, because if you have a locking situation, like one session is being locked by a session in another rack node, you will see a connecting line. So it's like nobody can argue, right? I mean, it's just like you can visually see it. So we're going to do a multi-instance report right here, and that's the letter M. So we're going to put an M in here, <clears throat> okay? All right, um, this is kind of confusing, but we just take the default, okay? I'll let you play around with that on your own. Okay, now this is important. Um, we need to know the exact date and time to the second of the data that we want to create the visualization. Remember, the visualization is a point in time picture, so I need to set the point in time, okay? So I'm going to pick one of those times of the data that we were looking at before, right? Shouldn't be a surprise. 15th of May, 2006. It's going to be, I think, 23, 10, 35 is what I typically show. Yeah, there we go. And that is one of those situations, right, where we had lock. Okay. Now, we need a delimiter. When we actually create the R code, um, this is R specific. It uses a dash for a delimiter. Okay. That'll be clear when we actually see the R code. 
There's another product that I use called Mathematica, and that's delimiter is a dash and a greater than sign, a little different right there, okay? All right, so I'm gonna take the default of a dash because we're gonna use R, press return, and we want a detail report, not a summary report. You guys can play around with that and do, do what you want. Press enter, boom, there's the R code right there. So once we have R up and running, we've loaded a couple libraries, all you do is type this, you take this and you paste it right into R, okay? Now, essentially what we're doing, this is our stuff here. Oh, you see the dashes? That's the delimiter right here. That's why we had to set that, okay? Um, essentially, what we're doing here in R, we don't have time to get into R here today, but we're gonna take all this information, we're gonna convert it into some graphical formula, and we're gonna store that information into a variable. And I called the variable my data. I could have called this anything, but I'm calling it my data because <clears throat> The way to visualize this, we're gonna, we're gonna run another command. And I actually have the command in the readme file, right, the Bloodhound readme file. And the command to cr actually create the visualization expects the variable containing this graphical data to be called my data. Now, you can change this, but then you better change, you know, what the actual code to create the visualization to reflect the name of the variable that you want to use. Okay, I mean, nobody does that, but I just wanted you to show that there's nothing special about this name syntactically. It's just, I just made that up. Okay, so let's get R going. Okay. Yeah, I'll copy that, but I really need to get R going first. And notice, you know, we're going to have to put in, you don't copy at that last comma down there, right? You're, you'll figure that out real quick. Okay, so I need to get R going here. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. So this is actually my readme file right here. So what you need to do is you need to install this package called iGraph. You can do this through command dropdowns in R, you know, through the interface, but you can actually type, because this is the prompt right here in R, is it greater than sign? Just type install.packages and type iGraph, and it will go out and get it and install it for you. It's kind of like an RPM kind of thing. So I'm going to start R on my desktop. Okay, that's it right there. And you will see something very similar to this. Now there's different ways to interact with R. This is the classic console. I like it because it's just simple and I'm used to using that, okay? So first thing I need to do is I better make sure that uh, the stuff's installed, okay? Like the library, okay? But first I'm gonna just load this data in here, copy that, I'm gonna paste it and I put the, the ending parenthesis on there, okay? Now the data is stored. Okay, so um, by the way, I, if I, don't, I guess I'm not going to show you this, but I would have needed to load this library once I've installed. There is um, that install was just above I showed you. You will then need to actually load the library right here. I mean, you'll know if you don't because you'll get an error. All right. So there's two ways we can plot this. There's a plot command and there's a TK plot. See the difference? That's just plot. These are our commands. And there's TK plot. The TK plot allows us to actually dynamically move the nodes around on the graph. That's why we're going to use that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste that right into R. And before our eyes, we're going to see this thing just like <laughs> create. There it is. That's the picture. Now, remember, there's not that many active sessions. So there's, it's not crazy. I'm going to show you a crazy one here at the end. I'm going to center this on the screen, and you can see, okay, there is our locking situation right there. That's it. This is other stuff that we don't really care about right now, okay? So what I'm going to do is I centered this. Now I'm going to, like, spread it out, and then, because, I mean, that's probably too small for you to read, right? At least it is on a big screen. So, um, so I'm going to probably eventually, here we go. I'm going to fit to screen. Boom. Okay, now look at this. See that? I'm going to grab that, move that down. Oh, is that cool? Is That is so cool. Because now I can get this to look just the way I want. This is very important because sometimes there's so many lines, these lines, you know, they can overlap. And so you, and, and you're not really sure, you know, what's connected to what. So sometimes if you move something, you can say, ah, there's actually two different lines there. And so moving these around allow me to do this. In this case, that the overlapping is not the issue. Is that I want to get this 
kind of tight together so I can screenshot this and then we can zoom into the screenshot. So that's why I'm really doing this, okay? But it's pretty cool. This is the really neat thing about uh, with this. So I'm gonna screenshot this and I'm gonna open up the, the PNG file. Boom, screenshot, there it is, okay? Now I'm gonna open this up and we're gonna zoom into this so now we can all see it really closely. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna read this to you, okay? And if you want to, if you download the presentation from DOAG, I actually have the text where you can, that actually, where you can actually read that the text actually has in it what I'm going to read to you right now, because this is kind of tricky if you're not used to doing this. So let's just, let's just pick this one right here. Let's start here. Notice this is a one colon. These all have one colon. That's because we're looking at sessions related to instance number one. Okay, that's how you know if one of these are linked to uh, an instance in another node, okay? Um, okay, so here we go. Instance one, this is session 1192, is running this SQL statement. It's not burning CPU, it's waiting on a row level lock held by session 2535, okay? What's session 2535 doing? Well, it's over here. It's running a different SQL statement. So it's very easy to see these are different SQL statements. And it's not burning CPU, it's waiting on a lock held by session 1747, okay? Oh, what's it doing? There it is. It's running yet again a different SQL statement. So it's really clear, right? Different SQL statement. And it's not burning CPU, it's waiting on a lock. Well, what's the lock held by? It's held by, um, um, by session uh, 152535. Uh, oh, okay, what's 2535 doing? It's uh, waiting on a lock held by 1747. What's 1747 doing? It's waiting for a lock held by 2535. And of course, you can see the loop right here. All right, so there you go, there's the deadline. All right, now, what happens is that when you do this to people that aren't used to this kind of thing, is that we've shown them, you may have shown them the numbers, okay? Okay, um, you may have shown the picture and maybe they'll get that. But if you then say this to them, they will have then heard it numerically, visually, and verbally. I don't know anybody I've ever gone through this with that doesn't get it after those three like ways of different stimuli, right? That they get this. So what happens is when I, when I actually do this for real, is I will say this a few times. And you look at people's faces and they're, and they're like, Craig, you're, you're repeating yourself. And I'll say, exactly, that's the deadlock. So they actually just stumbled it right into it. And I just, I just led them like this right into the trap. And I'll say, of course, I'm repeating myself. That's the deadlock. There's no way out. You're just stuck in this repeating loop. Okay. So that's what, I, that's what we would do. I mean, that's the situation there. Okay. So a couple more slides. I'm going to show you just the end of another situation. But let's kind of summarize what just happened here. Okay, this is what I just read you. And if you download the PDF or uh, uh, the PowerPoint from this, which is on my website, then this will kind of help you uh, so you can read through this yourself, okay? Um, okay, so what do we see? Well, first of all, here's some observations. There were no table level locks. That's important. I wanted to check that. The lock duration is not real long, right? 30 seconds was this thing right here. Uh, sessions are not blocked by the same session. A lot of people assume there's one blocker. That's not always the case here, right? Uh, there are multiple SQLs uh, involved. We can see that very clearly. We can also see the deadlock. We could see it, and it was it was at three different times we actually we actually saw that there was three samples, right? Three sample sets. Now that's what gave us the 30 seconds. Three times 10 second samples, 30 seconds. Okay, we visually saw the deadlocks. So this is the perfect storm. This is what I want people to understand here is that it's a combination of the dependencies and the batch processes with killing sessions and the row level locks that created this perfect storm, which eventually you're gonna end up in this situation like this, okay? So what are they gonna do about it? Well, the first thing is, is you go to the module, that in coin module, you find the SQL, which is going to be really simple. Just pull the SQL text for all three of these and give it to the developers and say, we know this is the module. 
obviously there's something going on here. You need to fix that. Okay. And you, you want to encourage DBAs not to kill sessions because that made it worse. But hey, I understand though that if things start locking and the batch process queue can also fill up because they're not killing the sessions. So the DBAs are kind of put in this really awkward situation, right? Where they have to kill sessions, but they don't want to because by killing the sessions, they can end up in the deadlock, right? So they're kind of in an unfortunate situation. So the module needs to be, and the SQL needs, uh, is what needs we need to take a look at here. Okay. Um, yeah, by the way, there's no way we could have solved this with an AWR report or AWR data, okay? We don't have the session level detail that we get with ASH, okay? All right, so I wanted to give you guys one more demo. You guys have any questions so far? We just have a couple more minutes. This one I can show you really fast, but this is amazing. This is like mind, like, you know, outer space kind of stuff here. All right, any questions? The room's still full. It's pretty, pretty crazy. I'm glad you guys are here. I hope you're, I hope you're getting some value out of this. <clears throat> All right. Absolutely. I, okay. Making me feel good now. All right. So let's do this other demo. Here's the situation. Okay. June 22nd. Oh, by the way, this is all production, right? I could make this up. Around 1400, a huge spike occurred on OEM, right? So things are going good. Things are going bad. Things are going good. That, that's, what, that's what the situation is. Okay. The operation team doesn't know what happened. They look at, they're like, yeah, there's a big thing on the screen, but you know, and they can drill down, but they still don't understand, right? This is the problem, man. As DBAs, guys, you got to get beyond the GUI. You got to get into the command line because they looked at the GUI, they clicked all they could, and they still didn't get it. All right. But that's what keeps me employed. So, all right. So everybody use the GUI then, right? Anyways, all right. So they didn't know what was going on and nobody called. They saw this huge thing on their screen. No users called. So management was starting to freak out because if there's this big blob on the screen and the IT folks are freaking out, but no users are calling, then that's when managers start to freak out, right? So it was like, what's going on? So they couldn't figure it out. And so I got involved, which is, I love this part of my job. These are my favorite type of engagements. Yeah. So this is what we saw in the alert log. There's English here. I think there's Spanish in here as well. It's just crazy, man. But we hit some maximum number of processes was set to, was set to 2,500 right here, okay? So there's a couple of really cool things. First of all, I know, I know the date and time. We got that nailed down. So that's a really big deal. I hit some processes, so I'm expecting to see a lot of processes. I saw this process right here. I had no idea, like, what the heck is PE78? I'm trying to think of all the Oracle products. What's PE? Is there performance, uh, encounter? You know, I, I'm like, what is this thing? And does anybody know what that is? PE78? Well, a, a buddy of mine was pretty sure he knew what it was, and he was correct. Somebody kind of in my personal little Slack team. What's PE78? Okay, well, we're going to find out what that is because it becomes really obvious a little bit later. So with that, let's start the typing, okay? All right, so I'm not going to show you everything here because uh, it's just we're going to run out, of, run out of time. So here's the second scenario right here. Okay, so um, I'm, we're going to – we got – we're in Bloodhound. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to run B8 set. I think you are probably correct there, Dow Walker. B8 set. So we're going we're gonna to set this up just like we did before. Okay, there we go. We did that. Now we're going to just go run BH visual, visual. So I skipped a bunch of stuff, right? This is the table, this spike, this June spike. That is where the data for this, uh, you know, all the ASH data is in this table. Okay. So, and this is going to be DBA HIS. This is not V dollar. This is DBA HIS data that I, that I exported, not exported. I, you know, well, I guess I did, but um, anyways, I loaded it into another table. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to just copy it or just take the default on that. What's the, uh, the DBA? What's that? The database ID. I'm going to have to probably copy and paste that. Yeah, that's it. Oh, nice. It's right there. So put that in there. This is going to be multi-instance. I always, for some reason, I always like to do multi-instance. 
And let's see, oh, we need a date and time. So I'm gonna pick a date and time from when I previously did the analysis, but you know it's gonna be right around what we saw in the alert log, say. Because remember, it has to be, let me pause this. This date and time, it has to be related to actual ASH data, right? So if there's no ASH data at the exact time that's recorded in the alert log, I'm gonna get nothing here, okay? All right. Hold on a sec, guys. I think my audio on my is going to drop here in a second. So if it does, you guys need to tell me, and then I'll go old school here. So I'm just getting ready for that right now. <laughs> I heard something. All right, so here we go. There's the date, and we got to we got to put the time in there as well. Okay, there's the date. Where's the time? Oh, I got it started. Here we go. 14:03:20. So there's got to be some ash data for there. Okay, and we're gonna want to do the, uh, we're gonna take the default, right, the delimiter, and we're gonna get the detail level report again, which is number two. Okay, get ready, a lot of stuff. <clears throat> oh, you don't even know how much stuff is there. There we go, nice, huh? Look at all that. See all these direct path reads? Woo, a lot, whoop, lot of stuff there. So we're gonna take that, okay? We're gonna copy this in, I'm gonna copy this. There we go. Oh, we've got to start R. So I'm going to load R. There we go. And what am I going to do? Okay, the package is installed. Oh, you know, it's been installed. Now i got to load it. Okay, this is what I didn't actually show you before. We've got to load the library. It's not going to like that, right? Yeah. Got to put that in quotes. Got it. Warnings are okay. All right. All right. So now we've got the library. Now I'm going to actually load the data. Okay. Okay, here we go. There's a lot of it, right? I'm just going to scroll down. Remember that? Don't take that last comma, right? You guys probably know that. You're used to this kind of stuff. Close that off with a the, with the parenthesis. Data is loaded. I, I did press it. Sometimes it takes a while. There's a lot of data. There's thousands of, of lines here that we're going to enter in this thing. Okay, stored it. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to get the actual plot command. So we're going to do this this TK plot right here, all right? Okay, but we're gonna use the one with real Oracle data because this is actually real production data, not just a little simple system. Okay, check this out. You guys ready? I'm gonna paste this in here. Here we go, I, I hit return, boom, watch this. This is real time you're looking at right here. It's creating this as I speak, woo! That's so awesome. I wasn't able to do this at DOAG. I ran out of time. There you go. So that's the picture. Is that cool? Huh? That is worth an hour and a half just staring at a screen here. So I'm going to zoom in on that. We're going to do the same kind of thing I did before. Okay, we're going to center it and expand it. I'm also going to show you some different ways to look at it. Okay. There's just this random layout. <clears throat> okay. This is cool. Okay. Let me stop this. You'll notice that there are, if you look at all, the, these are all the different sessions, right? Connected to SQL IDs or either on CPU or waiting. Um, and so you can see there's, there's a lot of people that are running this SQL statement, right? You can visually see this. And over here, this actually says there's direct path reads right here is the wave event. So we can see that there's like, there's, uh, what, there's popular nodes and we can learn something from that. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. That's kind of cool. Okay, but what we really need to get into is, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. We, we, we want to get this in a way uh, that, that our users will understand what's actually going on. So, hey, you guys can still hear me, right? Give me a say, yeah, I can hear you kind of thing. Yeah, okay, good, good. Thanks, Mark. All right, so we're going to create a different layout right now. I think we're going to do this two different ways. Oh, it's 835. We're going to finish up here in just a second. Okay, this is just one of the ways that, you know, that R gives me to create a picture here. This first one is like, okay, pretty cool, right? Um, but we're going to do it again, and for some reason, it's going to actually create it just the way I want. <laughs> okay, and here we go. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the middle there is the weight event and the SQL statement. So I'm going to pull out the weight event, and then I'm going to pull out the SQL statement. Okay, and I'm going to zoom in and then I'm going to pause this right here. Okay, 
Let me get this just the way I want. I'm going to screenshot this thing, and we're going to look at it. Oh, by the way, you see all the sequential reads right there? These are all the sessions that are waiting on sequential reads right here. Okay. All right. So continue on. Screenshot that, and we're going to pull that up, make it big. Boom. There we go. Okay. So there you go. Okay, what are all these sessions right here? Well, it turns out, right, they all are parallel query sessions, okay? Everybody's running, or all those sessions, these parallel query sessions are running the same SQL ID, and they're all waiting on a direct path read right here. And there are a couple sessions that are burning some CPU, okay? And interesting, there's, there's some sessions that are actually running the SQL statement that are doing sequential reads as well. So what happened in this situation is that um, you know, a parallel query just took over. Okay, and, and you might say, yeah, but how come nobody noticed this? Nobody noticed this because the box was so powerful, even though there were thousands of sessions that were running, right? Um, the box didn't even like, it, it didn't care. All the, the responsiveness for all the other users was still the same. That's why nobody called on the telephone. But there were too many sessions because Oracle had the session, you know, the max processes was set to the 2,500, just like you guys, you know, thought. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is, I mean, parallelism is great, right? The box clearly can handle the load. So my suggestion was to increase the number of processes after we checked with the OS guys to ensure they were okay with that many processes. If not, you need to crank down the max parallel query processes and everything's gonna be okay. Okay. So that's what that was all about. And it was pretty cool. That was one of my favorite diagrams right there. Okay. All right. So that's it for that. Any questions? We are going to finish up right now because we are late. Nice spider. Yeah. I call it. Usually I put the, the ends are like little cat head, like little cat ears if you put them on the top, but that's a whole different thing. Okay. Going deeper, uh, become an Orpub member. If this is the kind of stuff that you enjoy. Okay. Um, I got an Ash tuning class. If, if, if you want to you know, learn more about this, I have an AWR class that's actually starting tomorrow, believe it or not. Um, and um, you can download the toolkits, right? You can download those things for free, okay? And don't forget about this actual presentation. You might want to, want to know that. I also have a lot of this kind of information in my blog as well. So you might want to check that out uh, as well, okay? I think that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Doak, for letting me actually do this. So we are done. All right. Hey, thanks for listening, guys. I'll sign off here in a minute. But if you have any questions, I'll stand here. you will be here as long as, as long as you want. And uh, thanks for listening. I hope this was useful to you. My guess is that some of you guys are pretty excited about this, and you're going to want to check this out and do it yourself, which is what I'm hoping will actually happen. So cool. All right. Hey, thanks for listening, you guys. All right, Mark. Appreciate it, man. Cosman, Matt, awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. Any questions? Die Walker, good to have you on here. Good to have you on here. Sam, fantastic. Going to install R now. Yeah, it's super easy to install. Crazy easy, easy. All right. Rubber Paul, fantastic. Glad you could make it, man. All right, question CPU time and AWR top 10 events. What about that question? All right, Alberto, thanks for listening. Glad you could make it. Diharam, your question, is that a question? I'm not sure what you're asking me there. Bacliff, thank, hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us here, man. Hey, I really wanted, I wanted to have a coffee with you when we were in Prague, but we had, a, we, were, we were with a net, another couple, Katrina and myself, and then it was, it wouldn't have been good. So sorry about that. I hope we get a chance to meet and have a coffee sometime. Hong, thank you. Appreciate it. Fernando. Hey, Craig, what, in, what includes the skills assessment and certification? Oh, okay. What this means is for the recorded video seminars that I have, and you can watch those. Anybody can watch the intros. Um, there is a different assessment system where you basically take a test, right? And if you pass that, and they're, they're legitimate tests, if you pass that, you can, get a cert you can get a certificate for the video seminar. So that's what that's about. You pay extra for that. Some people like that uh, because, as we know, if you're going to be tested, even though it's, you know, 
something for like self enrichment, you actually learn better. And so that's why a lot of people do that. Plus they can show management if the company is paying for the membership that they're actually learning stuff, right? So that's another reason why the assessment's important to people. Uh, Jim, let's see, oh, cool. Fernando. Yeah, I, I, I'd say more than half people have the advantage membership to, to access the assessment system, okay? It's good, it's good. I've had people blow through seminars. I'm like, you're not learning anything, man, you know? So it's really good. Okay, Jim, uh, let's see your question. How do you troubleshoot and tune statements running less than one second? Aha. Um, <clears throat> well, if they less than, okay, here's how I look at it. If it's just, if it only runs once, then, then you know, we're not going to care. And even if it runs less than a second, if it's run a bunch of times, you're still going to see it in ASH, right? Because sometimes, you know, if, 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 if we, if ASH samples here and here, uh, sometimes it's going to start here and end here, so we won't see it. It's not going to happen all the time. So eventually, you are you are actually going to see it, and um, but that's the best you can do with our or with with Ash. Okay, what you could do, but I don't know anybody who's done this. Unfortunately, is you can actually have Ash sample more frequently. Okay, and so you can keep more data in the ring, the Ash ring in the shared pool, and you could kind of offset that by having less data copied to the AWR tables. So you don't get too much data because there you will impact your system if you're sampling super you know, frequent and, and that information is being you know, archived. So you gotta watch out for that. But yeah, it's, it's, um, there, there are other techniques too to do that, right? You can do some operating system tools you can use for that. There are other ways to do this, okay? But you are limited though, yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, that's because we're sampling, right? And uh, the only way to improve the, I, I guess, the likelihood of getting more, of more information would be to increase the sample rate, which you can do in Ash, but you got to recycle the instance. Okay. Uh, that's, that's the best I can give you, okay, in terms of using Ash, though. Okay. Uh, Baklev, I have spider with index contention. I have... I, ha I have to resolve it. Bloodhound Toolkit is a good tool. Yeah, well, I use it. I mean, I developed this thing on a, for a consulting engagement where I could not, I could, I could not, all I could do was do a select statement on the box. I could do nothing. I, it was ridiculous. So I did this to get the remote data locally so I could then do the work without any DML, DDL, nothing. So, and it allowed me to do some really cool stuff because of that. Yeah, Jim, I wish I had a better answer for you, but um, I don't. There's limit. There's limitations on this kind of thing. Right. But you know, if if it if it's a popular SQL statement, even though it's fast, you're going to see it in Ash. It's not going to disappear. So you'll you'll be able to see sessions that are running in the modules, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's a common Ash question, though. All right, yeah, we still got a bunch of people on. Um, any other questions? Oh. Harm, thanks, man. I don't know what your that's probably not your actual real name, but uh, or all of it. Um, thank you. Yeah, I like doing these webinars, they're a lot of fun. Yeah, the next one we're going to do is going to be about uh, on the buffer cache for the members about cache buffer chains. We're going to do kind of a part two on that. That's coming up in a couple of weeks. All right, well, I, guys, I think that's it. No more questions. So that's going to be it. Mohammed, great. From Denmark, fantastic. Thanks for being here. So I'm going to sign off. If you guys have questions, you can always email me. Other than that, um, you know, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great rest of the week and all the best in your local performance tuning work. Bye, friends.